He is a pop icon, a cultural icon. He's done everything from a cameo in a very merry Muppet Christmas movie to his own adult film series. He's an entrepreneur, an actor, a father, and a little league coach. To think he was once a drug dealing gangbanger from Long Beach, California, he has risen from a tough world of gang signs and drug deals to ride the current of the mainstream. With his woozy yet lethal delivery, constant self-references, sleepy eyes, and laid-back flow, he has remained one of the most unique characters in the rap community. By rising above 12 years of setbacks and situations, Snoop Dogg has truly paid the cost to be the boss. Born Calvin Brodius on October 20, 1972, to Beverly Tate and Bernal Bernardo, he was given the nickname Snoop because his mother believed he favored the popular Peanuts character, Snoopy. Snoop Dogg, Snoop Doggy Dogg, formerly known as, followed his career ever since its inception. I was living, been raised out in LA pretty much all my life. And so Snoop Dogg, when he first came into the scene, was deemed as the savior of West Coast music after the demise of you know, NWA and these other West Coast artists. Snoop came with Dr. Dre and this whole big gangster music boom just like landed on the world. And he was the, the spokesperson for that. And his first album, uh, What's My Name? What's it called? What's My Name? Snoop Dogg, What's My Name? Snoop Dogg. What? He's had like billion and two albums, they're all Snoop Dogg something. Either way, his first album was just wonderful. It had the single, What's My Name, on there. It had Gin and Juice on there. So many rap classics this man has produced. As a child, he had his fair share of promise, but not enough opportunity. He played Pop Warner football for much of his childhood years and was into all sports. He made above average grades in school, Brodus showed musical talent early on, dancing and performing whenever music was on the radio. He seemed destined to escape his environment, but it would be an uphill battle. Bernal Bernardo left the family when Snoop was just a boy. Although Bernardo did manage to stay in the picture with regular calls or visits, Beverly still had to bear the brunt of raising Snoop and his two half brothers. This is a pill, man. He, he, Snoop get a hood, you know what I mean? Like Snoop represent the hood, and like that's what hip hop is basically all about. You know what I mean, when Snoop dropped and went from total East Coast music to straight West Coast, you know what I mean? And gave the people a new breath. And so like when the people heard that, Snoop blew their mind. It was like, yo, Dr. Trey came out that chronic. Chronic 2000, it was over. Well, he definitely helped put the West Coast on the map. Um, being from where he's from, there's a lot of rappers, and you know there was um, N.W.A. before him, and of course uh, Dr. Dre came out of that. So I think that uh, he's pretty much he was pretty, he was like the first first guy to start breaking out into movies. That would mean hard times for the future legend. Soon, Snoop had found an anesthetic for all the pains of the ghetto. And it's not what you think. Snoop befriended Warren Griffin, destined for fame under the stage name Warren G, who happened to have a beat machine. They began making beats, and Snoop would freestyle rhyme over them. I still like him for the G thing. And that was, uh, that was Dr. Dre video, but I still like Never the G thing with Snoop in it because that was Snoop. That was a young Snoop that was introduced to everybody, so to speak. And I still like that. Uh, the early Snoop Dogg was definitely wild, definitely wilding out. He just. He was Snoop from Long Beach. He was known. He was a street guy. You know what I'm saying? He he had street credibility, and uh, he was a new hip hop artist. So being in the game, especially at that era when hip hop music was just starting to make its way mainstream, uh, you know, he took a cat from the hood, you brought him out to mainstream. 
uh, he was living it up, living it up. And I can recall one time personally being at a Death Row Records party, which uh, he was signed to. And uh, Snoop was wild and out. He knew how to party, he knew how to have people around him. Uh, he knew how to have fun people around him. Snoop has always, always been about the ladies. And that means having a lot of ladies around. A lot of ladies in short skirts, beautiful ladies, and just having a good time, partying it up. Uh, big smoking for sure. That's Snoop Dogg. Cannot go without saying that because that's just keeping it real with Snoop Dogg. And aesthetics, however, wear off. Despite walking the straight and narrow early on, he soon joined the Crips, a prominent street gang in Los Angeles, and he began selling drugs. Brodius's outlaw behavior drove a wedge between he and his mother. He soon moved out at the age of 16 feeling it would be easier on his mother if he took care of himself. After a period of drifting, Snoop Dogg would eventually return to music, joining forces with Warren G and Nathaniel Hale, also known as Nate Dogg. They formed the group 213. Shortly after his high school graduation in 1990, Snoop would be arrested for dealing cocaine. He spent the next three years in and out of jail. And so, just his whole style, man. He, he, like he gives, he puts Los Angeles, he puts California on the map. And just like California, there's no other people in the whole world like cats from California, from Los Angeles, from Long Beach. You know what I mean, that style is, is wow. So, him with the chucks on, him doing the blue, repping his hood, you know what I mean? Doing all this stuff that people have never seen before. And so they, they, they lunch to it because it's like, oh man, who this new cat? This new cat named Snoop, man, he come out and, and, and he's different than any other artist like you would see, especially when he first came out. And I talk about when he first came out because he's still on a buzz from then until now. You see what I'm saying? When he first came out, you saw Cats and Tim's, Snoop's fellow inmates are said to have recognized that he was destined for something exceptional. Believing he could reform, they encouraged him to get his life together. Big Snoop Dogg did just that. Turning back to his first love, he and Warren G began recording homemade demos. G had the presence of mind to give the tape to his stepbrother, Andre Young, also known as Dr. Dre. Man, Snoop is, he got a personality that everybody can love. My grandmother talk about Snoop. So if my grandmother, my mother, she, she don't listen to what happened, but if my mother know about somebody, that is something about him. Snoop just got this personality that everybody can, can bite into. You know, he just a cool guy like that. Hey, I mean, that was like, he was a real cool rapper when he first came out. Then he went with uh, the other label. I'm like, man, I don't really like Snoop that much. Then his next album, he just reinvented himself where he just came back. And it wasn't like, I don't want to say the old Snoop, but he gave something new. He come out like a new artist, everything he do. A new artist that you kind of hear. See, Snoop is so thorough, man. The only person you can compare him with is Snoop. In the early 1990s, Dr. Dre's career was already blazing down the trail to legendary. As an original member of the trend-setting group N.W.A., he was one of the founding fathers of West Coast gangster rap. Upon hearing Snoop Dogg's mesmerizing delivery, Dre immediately began the collaboration that would mean a transformation from gangster rapper to legendary music producer for Dr. Dre and would spark a love affair between Calvin Brodius and the world. Um, no Snoop personally through interactions with Snoop Dogg, uh, more so from the radio station uh, or my earlier years on. And I was at that radio station uh, here in Los Angeles, KKBT The Beat, uh, from 1993 to 1999. So that was pretty much the start of Snoop Dogg's uh, music career as a hip-hop artist. And his first year, uh, I would have to say KKBT 92.3 The Beat here in LA put him on the map. <laughs> Uh, it was kind of the first year that hip-hop rap music even made its way to the airwaves here in Los Angeles. Uh, I mean, of course, back in the day we had AM stations, but I'm talking about the first initial step in hip-hop radio becoming what it is today. And Snoop Dogg was definitely one of those artists that at the time I was just starting uh, my beginning years in radio, uh, he was definitely one of the artists that 
was getting all the radio plays. Snoop Doggy Dog, you know, his first hit. Uh, Dr. Dre, having already been the Dr. Dre from NWA, uh, this was his first protege, so to speak, uh, and he blew up. The first time the world heard Snoop Dogg's signature flow would be on the track Deep Cover from the soundtrack of the Lawrence Fishburne movie of the same name. In a voice as tranquil as the purring of a kitten, Snoop warns, it's 187 on an undercover cop. Later that same year, Dre released his solo debut, The Chronic, with Snoop maintaining the lion's share of the vocals. It quickly became a multi-platinum classic, yielding the top 10 hit, Dre Day and the Grammy nominated Nothing But A G-Thing. G-Thing just missed that elusive top spot, stalling at number two. Fresh off the buzz from the chronic came Snoop's highly anticipated debut album, Doggy Style. Due to the hype surrounding this stoned out gangster, the album entered the charts at number one, the first ever debut album to do so. Doggy Style would go on to go platinum, propelling Snoop into the spotlight and into millions of homes across the world. Calvin Brodius had finally made it. The album was original and accessible. He was just your neighborhood corner boy regulating the world with tales of what he saw in his neighborhood. His character, you can kind of compare him to like, you know, anything 70s, whether it's uh, all, the, all those old classic 70s movies like Shaft or, you know, things like that. Just, or any, a pimp, <laughs> you know, any, anything smooth. Anything smooth you could pretty much compare him to, you know. When you see him, that's what you think. Instantly 70s, even when he's in modern gear. You saw cats doing all kinds of stuff in their videos. But now you see Snoop, his whole style. He got the free, he got the freaking pigtails. He chilling, he chilling on the, he chilling on the block with his girls and the, and go on a bicycle, you know what I mean? Remember that one? Yeah, man, like, ain't nobody ever saw nothing like that before, man. His whole style is just, it's just Snoop, you know what I mean? I think it has to do with his production, his music, the people that um, surround him, and mainly himself, you know what I mean? Because he's his own, I think he's his own entourage. I think he's his own people because it's a lot of artists that came out around Snoop that was hot as Snoop. You see what I'm saying? And, and they fell off. So it's something about him that is, that's going far. I mean, we in 2005, what is it, 2005, and we still rocking the Snoop album, you know what I mean, like that, that's hot. In his blue dickies, wearing his cornrows, with his eyes slung low, he talked about pimping, cripping, and smoking marijuana with such tranquility in his voice that it had to be real. The people loved him for that. They loved his honesty. Well, maybe not all of them. Of the millions of listeners, there were complaints. Critics blasted him for being misogynistic, rapping about pimping, and his liberal use of the word bitch and hoe. Other detractors also attacked his many marijuana references, claiming he was flaunting drug use. I think as we all grow, man, you know what I mean? I think as we all grow, we all take different forms. You see what I'm saying? This is just a part of his, his growth process. You see what I'm saying? Like, is it a crossover? Um, nah, Snoop's still keeping it hood. It's just 2005 now. You see what I'm saying? It's just, it's just 2005. He got that joint out. Drop it like it's high. That joint, that joint is high. He, he keeping it, he keeping it still hood. I wouldn't say so much bona fide. I think, I think the roles you were in kind of fit. You know what I mean? Baby boy, it's gangster, you know. You just go back to where you came from. Starts being hutch, he was 70s. That's that's his style, that's his, you know, he ain't got to jump real far. I mean, they were cool. I, that one movie, I think he had the leading role, the vampire, Bones. Right. You know, so, I mean, it was okay to me. It wasn't nothing, you know, it wasn't like, ooh. He's a great actor in there. It's, it's just a regular scary movie, but, you know. Snoop maintained that he was only rapping about reality. He would soon have proof. In August of 1993, 29-year-old gang member Philip Wolderman was shot and killed in a drive-by. 
the suspects, Calvin Brodius and McKinley Lee. In a rare instance of life imitating art, Snoop Dogg is now wanted for murder. Snoop would turn himself into the police, but not before further smudging the line between fantasy and reality. Prior to turning himself in, Snoop would appear at the MTV Awards to hound that out award and perform his single, Murder Was The Case. This is Gangsta Pill. I mean, like suburbs and suburbs, and you see, you see Snoop, right? And, and like, you know what I mean, in the suburbs, it's all kinds of different people in the suburbs, not only just white folks, but like, that's mainly people who buy his album, but the people in the suburbs, white folks in the suburbs, they ain't never been to the hood. They don't know what the hood look like. So, 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 so that's the only reach to the hood, is Snoop. And so to them, it looks like, oh, oh my God, Snoop is like, you know what I mean? Snoop like the king because it's something foreign from just seeing houses, all nice grass everywhere. You see what I'm saying? You go back to the hood, you don't, you know what I mean? You don't really see that. I mean, we keep up our hood neighborhood, we keep up our grass, but look at it. I mean, look out on the street corner. It's all kinds of crack addict thieves. Just a lot of stuff to go on. But I mean, that's what makes it more appealing to everybody. You see what I'm saying? Just his, his gangster, you see what I'm saying? Aside from fueling public interest in him and boasting his street credibility, Snoop's arrest was also his first test as a celebrity, and he proved quite media savvy, releasing an 18-minute Dre-directed short film entitled Murder Was the Case, loosely based on the real event surrounding the case. The accompanying soundtrack is now platinum. Much of 1994 and 1995, however, was spent dealing with his impending trial. Though he had big hits with What's My Name and Gin and Juice, he was unable to do much promotion for the album or tour. By the time he was acquitted in February of 1996, the rap world was already on its path to a major change. M-O-N-E-Y. You know what I mean, I would say about his money. I think that's the, I think that's the proper thing, man. He's about his money and everybody else around him. You know what I mean, he can he can eat now, and the rest of his crew can eat. I think, I think, I think I would say he's about his crew, but I think he's about the M O N E Y because that's really the things that move stuff in this world. So, yo, his longevity and his talent in different avenues of game, he's an artist. You know, he does the pornos. You know, he does the acting. He's almost not so much a role model, but. He's like the representative of, you know, like hip hop worldwide. You go anywhere in the world and say Snoop Dogg, they know, you know who that is. In early 1996, Snoop's longtime friend and mentor, Dr. Dre, announced that he was leaving Death Row Records. In September, the rap world would be devastated by the fatal shooting of Tupac Shakur. Shakur was a longtime friend and label mate of Snoop's and many would argue the greatest rapper to ever live. In the wake of his tragic death, questions emerged surrounding Death Row's possible involvement in the murder, casting a menacing shroud over the entire Death Row camp and eating away at the public's appetite for gangster rap. As if this chaos wasn't enough, amid an abundance of rumors circulating about Death Row's CEO Suge Knight's ghetto mobster style management tactics, Knight was imprisoned on racketeering charges. It was against this backdrop that Snoop released his sophomore strike, The Dog Father. But with Death Row's biggest star deceased and the CEO in prison, the album would put up only half of Doggy Style's numbers. Nonetheless, the album would enter the charts at number one. I'll compare that dude to freaking Al Green. I compare to Al Green because Freaking Al Green, when he came out, Al Green was smooth, man. You see what I'm saying? You know, Al Green came out and like, Al Green, people don't know, Al Green was a pimp. You see what I'm saying? And now look at Snoop, he a pimp. You see what I'm saying? Now, now Al Green, he doing his church thing, but like, yo, the, the, the way Snoop do his money is like church to him. You see what I'm saying? He getting his money. So, yo. Yo, Snoop, I compare him to Al Green, you see what I'm saying? That's a lot of respect, but he's doing a lot of things in the industry now. You see what I'm saying? He's real big, so yeah. 
characters, you know, his, his swag, his, the whole, the whole pink thing, you know, you know, that, and that's from being, when he started with Dre, you know, it's the same way Dre is, you know, Snoop, he, he's got the curly hair, you know, known for smoking weed, you know, known for making great movies, you know, uh, what else, you know, you know, everything, it's all that stuff, he does with the rapping, the, he was acting, been acting lately, you know, and training then, you know, that Starkey Hutch thing, you know, things like that. Finally free from legal obligations, the rapper planned a spring tour. On March 9th, 1997, mere weeks after Snoop appeared on the Steve Harvey show on the Warner Brothers Network in an attempt to quell gossip about the East Coast West Coast rivalry, Tupac Shakur's East Coast rival, the notorious B.I.G., was killed in a drive by in Los Angeles. Out of respect for both the hip hop hero and his own safety, Snoop Dogg canceled his tour. Characters, you know, his, his swag, his, the whole, the whole pink thing, you know, you know that, and that's from being, when he started with Dre, you know, it's the same way Dre is, you know, Snoop, he, he's got the curly hair, you know, known for smoking weed, you know, known for making great movies, you know, uh, what else, you know, you know, everything, it's all that stuff he does with the rapping, the, he was acting, been acting lately, you know, and training then, you know, that Starkey Hutch thing, you know, things like that. Not one to give up easily and needing to remain in the public eye, Brodus hit the stage that year agreeing that he would sign up to perform at the Lollapalooza Tour, one of the biggest rock festivals since Woodstock. While frolicking the mainstream that summer, Snoop kept his street smarts about him, investing in a $140,000 custom-built Chevy van, complete with bulletproof windows and gun slits. Snoop and gangster rap, it don't really, uh, it goes, but it doesn't as much. Like, it's not like, you know, G and 50, that's more gangster rap nowadays. It's, he's more like, he's more commercial, more uh, suburban, you know, especially now that he's with uh, Star Trek and all of that, you know, those songs, his first two singles, it was more like R&B joints, you know, rapping over some R&B stuff. It ain't, it ain't like, you know, a gin and juice or, What's my name? You know, that's that was more his gangster stuff, but I mean, you, you gotta do what you do as time involves, you gotta evolve. Yo, see, yeah, I, I tell y'all fans out there, man, if y'all want Snoop to keep it real, y'all gotta give him some more money. I mean, that, that's what it's really all about, man. I mean, like, yo, if y'all wanna shoot, man, come on, man, everybody know the world go around on that money, man. Like, I keep on saying that because you see, you see people change. You know what I mean? It's all about that dollar bill. So, him keeping it real, he's going to keep it as real as his pocket is. I mean, it makes sense, but to, to his people, the way he's leaving back and the way he's leaving his, like, dang, man, I used to love the old Snoop, but Snoop used to be like this, it used to be like that, but, man, like, Snoop doing him right now, so. The deaths of Tupac and Biggie and the drama that followed made Brodius a more mature man. In June of 1997, he would marry his longtime girlfriend and manager, Shantae Taylor. This marriage would be a high point in the troublesome times for the big boss dog. Death Row Party were, uh, it was actually here in downtown Los Angeles. It was for the 1995 Soul Awards. Big awards party, Death Row Records, uh, their early star, Dog Pound, Lady of Rage, Snoop Dogg, all the early kind of forefathers of the Death Row crew. And Snoop Dogg uh, was just so blended out of his mind. And if you were there or if you weren't there, you just, I'm sure you've seen Snoop through the years. He's done his thing, even a time when he wasn't smoking. Um, there was no Kermit in the front of the but anyways, uh, this time was one of the first early times that I seen Snoop Dogg out of his mind. <laughs> and uh, it wasn't too too soon after that uh, I got to hang out and just kick it with Snoop and being at his house. Uh, one time at his house, we, we did a video. Uh, it was actually, they were filming a video and then he did the Master P. Um, I can't believe she's the type of person that but, uh, 
did a DVD, or he was doing his own videos, and he did two at his house. Uh, the game is to be sold, not to be told, between that project. And uh, the videos were done in his backyard, and at Snoop Dogg's house, actually one of his houses now, and at his house back then, uh, which he still has, uh, it's a really big, nice house in sun, sunny, sunny California, and uh, it's out of the city life. Um, big house in his backyard. He has a little miniature house called the Dog Father House. And a big Dog Father sign. And to the right is a full basketball court. It's all painted by Los Angeles Lakers. And then he has a big pool. And in the back is his kennel with all of his dogs. And he has, of course, a lot of wild Big dog. <laughs> The deaths of Tupac and the notorious B.I.G. left the public wanting something lighter. The grit of the ghetto lost its luster when the public was confronted with proof that gangster rappers really are recording reality. Snoop's popularity was threatening to wane. Though he didn't have any gripes with anyone, his association with Death Row cast a foreboding shadow over his life and his career. Seeking to save himself, Snoop wrangled his lanky six foot four inch frame out of his contract with Death Row and into the No Limit camp. Snoop would go on to release three moderately successful LPs as the No Limit Soldier. The game is to be sold, not to be told, Top Dog, and The Last Meal. All three albums did go platinum, but fans were still searching for something as extraordinary as Doggy Style. Percy Miller, Master P, head of No Limit Records, has always had his hands in the television, film, music, NBA basketball, toys, and fashion industries. One could say he's somewhat of an industry all by himself. Naturally, Miller would give Snoop some diamond bezeled jewels of knowledge for diversifying his career. Brodus would emerge from Master P's tutelage, a far more focused individual, and driven to further branch out in his profession. He would later say that he learned everything not to do from death row and everything what to do from No Limit. Snoop would leave No Limit an older, wiser dog. His responsibilities as a father and a husband, he married his longtime girlfriend and manager Shantae in June of 1997, pushed him back toward home where he could feel a better focus. And he would need that focus to manage all of the projects he embarked on. Doggy Style, Snoop's new media company distributed by MCA, will feature both record label and film production divisions. In line with all of his first endeavors, the first release from Doggy Style, Snoop Dogg Presents, The East Siders, added another platinum record to his belt. Um, when he was at Death Row Records, that's when you, know, you had Tupac, you had you know, all these other artists, the Dog Pound, it was just the epitome of West Coast music. And I know I'm going all over the place, but that's how his career has been. It hasn't been in one line to me. It's been, he's done this, he's done that, he's backtracked, he's done this. And regardless, he's managed to stay in the public's eye and he's managed to crank out album after album, many of which, if not all, go platinum, at least, at least. And people would argue that he's lost some of his edge since the rapper appeared on the big screen four times in the year 2001 alone in the movies The Wash, Training Day, Baby Boy, and Bones. He snagged the title role in Bones, playing a slain drug dealer whose soul returns to avenge his death. Always eager to explore uncharted territory, Snoop decided to try his hand in the adult entertainment industry with the first of an all-intended series, Doggy Style Volume 1 on Hustler Video. Continuing his history of stellar debuts, the video won two Adult Video News Awards for Best Music and Top Selling. He would also publish an autobiography, The Dog Father, The Times, Trials, and Hardcore Truths I like of Snoop Dogg. I him in Starsky and Hutch. I mean, it was a small role, but it was just, it couldn't have been any better. Like, it was just so... It was just, it was just so believable. Like, who else could you have gotten to do something like, like in that role? And just seeing the fact, once again, there you go, it's mainstream. It was a mainstream film. And, you know, 
despite like, the many films that you know come about, it's just like when you're able to kind of infiltrate the mainstream and be a recognizable character, I think that's a big accomplishment in itself, especially when you are a quote unquote a gangster rapper. But it's, I mean, it is what it is. I mean, I think with, with Snoop, it's, it's just, people just accepted it. I mean, what, you, what can you do? I mean, you know, all the drama that went on, you know, things in the past with Pac, and then, you know, with all the different political figures, and the whole West Coast thing arising, I think that just, it's just become accepted. Like I said, you know, Snoop, then the song Drop the Light is Hot, he's still talking about the blue flag hanging out the backside. So, I mean, it's just basically, we live in a world where you just gotta accept it. So. Co-authored with David Say, who helped pin Mick Jagger's autobiography. Lastly, he premiered his television show, Doggy Fizzle Televisual, on MTV late that year. As Snoop's life had proved a seesaw of sorts, he would also get arrested in Amherst, Ohio, for possession of marijuana. He pleaded no contest and received a suspended 30-day jail sentence and a fine of $250 plus court cost. Five months later, Snoop would do an interview with the show Access Hollywood discussing his decision to quit the drug, citing his desire to focus on his career and to be a better father to his children. At the end of 2001, Snoop Dogg had become a certified household name with his hand in all facets of media, including commercials. Brodius was everywhere, yet and still, he had one more river to cross. I remember, you know, funny story, something I remember throughout my life. I used to be an extra in different films, and I was on the set of I think, Menace to Society as an extra when I was like 10. And I was listening to these older boys, who were probably 14, 15, just walking by, and they were singing or rapping the lyrics to What's My Name. And it was a song that was out at the time, I think I was maybe a little bit older than 10. But the song was out, and I didn't know the words. They were just rapping, and I was just really into it. And it just, <laughs> that's a really funny, or a really short story, but it's just, it just, at that moment, was like, wow, they know Snoop Dogg, too? I thought, I don't think Snoop Dogg. You know, I was kind of feeling ownership over him because I loved him so much and had a little crush on him when I was younger because he's kind of cute back then before the porn thing and all that. I've, I've purchased some of his albums. Uh, gosh. There's so many songs I can name. Beautiful, which is the summer song from two years ago or a year and a half ago. It was like the, the hit of the summer. That's still, I, I play that all the time. My friends and I love to try and recreate the scene as if we're in Brazil somewhere. And that made a lot of people want to go to Brazil. Definitely did. Um, like I said, What's My Name? Gin and Juice. From the deep cover soundtrack, the 187 song with Ice T, I mean, not actually not Ice T, but um, Dr. Dre, once again, I know Ice T is top killers, dog with 187 on the cover of up, um, was very controversial at the time. Trying to figure out a term for this whole thing, that's where this whole gangster music thing came from, because they were, uh, the, the artists and things uh, were seen as kind of part of the counterculture. They weren't this safe, you know, class of conditions. They're challenging authority, in April of 2001, a car carrying three men pulled up alongside Snoop's convoy. One of the three men wanted to speak with Snoop Dogg. Words were exchanged, and soon shots were fired. Snoop Dogg emerged unscathed, though a bodyguard was injured. It is the second time in his career that he has been under fire. Fast forward two months to the BET Music Awards. Moments after his security detail dropped him off at the Kodak Theater, where the event was held, six of Snoop's bodyguards were detained by the police. Four of them would be subsequently fired from their part-time positions with the Inglewood Unified District Police Force. Suddenly, it seems Snoop had a bullseye on his chest. He was hit with various lawsuits in the early 2000s. An unnamed man filed suit against him for allegedly using his voice without his permission on the track Pimp Slap on the Paid the Cost to Be the Boss LP released in November of 2002 the man identified as Jim Bob on the LP left a message on Snoop's answering machine declaring his support for him and his continued rivalry with Suge Knight 
Since the album has been released, he claimed his life had been threatened. It was like, you know, I was like, you know, all the things that was going on with my death row and things like that. And he kind of had to jump around with different labels just to kind of fill himself out. And I, I, I applaud that effort. You know, most of us would have just shut down. So the fact that he just kept going, kept being sued, he didn't even change his style up. I mean, he just, I mean, he just... He, he took him a while to get where he is, and now he got that newest album, Rhythm and Gangsta, which is, I think is really good. It's very, it's a grown-up snoop, in a way, um, but it's still laid back. I mean, he's not kicking no, nothing different. He ain't changing nothing, but um, I definitely applaud his effort. Uh, the one with the, uh, what is it, the Dramatics? Doug Doug World? Yeah. I think, because, uh, like I said, he's real 70s, and he kind of went way back in the video. He got them on stage with him. And he got, and he still had some of the gangster in it because I believe her dad was on that song also. You know, um, I mean, you could even go back to like Ben and Juice or What's My Name. That was like the beginning where it started. That could come on another 20 years from now, and you know, people in our era still going, I remember that. You know, I was glad we age and woo woo, and that was the beginning of the West Coast was really riding and woo, you know. So that, that kind of sticks out too. Somebody, you know, uh, in his entourage is definitely around. But uh, once again, I think that he's, he's just a truly, truly gifted performer, um, rapper, and MC. In addition, Brodius was named in a lawsuit against Joe Francis, the man behind the, the inexplicably wildly popular Girls Gone Wild franchise. The plaintiffs alleged that Snoop encouraged them to abuse alcohol ecstasy at marijuana while shooting Girls Gone Wild doggy style in February of 2001 in New Orleans. Um, just stay Snoop, just stay, you know, how he is and not necessarily change his image. Um, you know, change the way that, you know, he raps and delivers things. Um, you still see Snoop, Snoop is still high when you see him. I mean, he still be, you know, he, he just, that's what he does. He'll go on radio interviews, he'll go on the shows, and he'll be Snoop. I mean, it's, it's just so, that's what in fact keeps, I think, a longevity, a longevity in a career like that. The fact that you can just stay true to who you are. Just like he's just simple and just slick. I mean, there's nothing complicated about him. It's like, you know, Snoop is one of those people, it's what you see is what you get. So, um, I mean, I definitely think that that's what a lot of people can appeal to. It's just, I mean, you know, you're not gonna, you're not gonna have, have to just act up on you. I mean, I think it's just, it's what you see is what you get. So, Snoop just reminds me of just one of those laid back '70s George Parliament type of, of people. Um, just because he, he's just so, I mean, he's just so simple, and he, there's, there's no complications to him. Sadly, Snoop's seven-year marriage to Shante Taylor, his longtime girlfriend, would not withstand the turbulence. Snoop filed for divorce in May, citing irreconcilable difficulties, although it is rumored that they are back together and trying to work things out. Um, him going into the porn has <laughs> been, you know, he basically kicked off this whole hip hop slash porn thing that's going on now, you know, so he's always been an innovator, he's always been a very heavy influence on what other people do in the music industry, and everyone, like most rappers, you know, especially in the West Coast, cite him as one of their influences. Um, he was able to, to bring New York and LA together at a time when they were, there was beauty. Simple and laid back and not at all complicated. And another guy. When you tell your name, I'm trying to your occupation. Okay. First, you tell us your name and your occupation. Okay. And then we'll go back. First, you tell us your name and your occupation. And then you can tell us what it is about Queen Latifah that makes her so popular. Jarvia and Joseph. I think Snoop is just 
so laid back that you just you gotta you can't help but to like him. He's managed to kind of become popular with mainstream. I mean, when you have blue collar people talking about for shizzle my nizzle, you know that he's made an impact. As he had been doing all of his life, Big Snoop Dogg bounced back. He poured his problems into the RG Rhythm and Gangster masterpiece. His perseverance paid off. The lead single from Snoop's sixth release, Drop It Like It's Hot, would be his biggest hit to date. It would be the single to take him to that coveted number one spot. It was his first number one in his 12 year career. I think my favorite one is Beautiful, just because from, from two albums ago, just because it really painted this beautiful picture of Brazil. And I know the video was mainly for the men, because it was nothing but naked girls running around or half naked girls. But it made me want to go to Brazil. It made me want to be one of the girls in the video. It just looks so pretty. The, uh, um, Chris Robinson was a director, a wonderful director of videos. Um, another video. The classics. I love uh, What's My Name, him riding on the, the bike with the two braids. And that was just the epitome of LA at the time. Just, and having somebody braid your hair. And, um, Gin and Juice being in the, the drive-in movie theater, that was cool. <laughs> just, they, his, his videos tend to be very comical. From this last album, not the current one, but the one before, uh, the 213 album, excuse me, which is him reuniting with Warren G and Nate Dogg, his 213 clip that never really was able to put out an album. It's like one of the first, if not the first album that they were able to put out. The video for the, the the first single, Ruby Love, was just hilarious. And you had these girls dressing up in fat suits and big teeth and, and crazy makeup and hair. It was looking real crazy. It was just funny. And I was at 106 in Park, BET's you know, daily countdown show. And um, Snoop Dogg was actually the guest at the time, and they were premiering the video for it. And so it was just really ironic. I'm from New York, I'm raised in LA. I go back to New York, and here's Snoop Dogg once again, you know, in New York, doing Ruby Love. And he's, he comes out with his chucks and his blue. I think he had on some, 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 like, some USC gear or something like that, you know. And it was just, it's great. You know, people respect him no matter where he goes. Maintain a career, you know. <laughs> And, and maintain a consistent career. Whereas, let's see who other artists have come and gone. Snoop is still been there and he's been able to uh, evolve his career where if his album come out, it's not that great. Like he's like he did the, the uh, stuff with uh, Hefner and all that. The videos, you know, he's, he's taking his money and his, uh, and his popularity and what started off as a rap career and evolved it into a whole, you know, monopoly. You know, he's, he's a guest on Jay Leno and, you know, doing things. Like I said, he's all over the world. You know, gone, he's gone as far as the new producers are Star Trek and, I mean, Neptunes. And he's gone as far as now I'm, I'm over here with them. And then before that, he was over with Master P in the South. So even if there were haters down there, he went, he found the hottest thing at the time and joined up with them. You know, when he joined up with P, it was bigger. There wasn't really no cash money. It wasn't like... Who else was down there? You know, Louis Chris, there wasn't a Def Jam South. Master P was the biggest thing. He said, I'm going to get with them. I'm the biggest thing in the West now, like the biggest producers on the East. Even though they're not as big anymore, but they're still the Neptunes. He's with them, making hits with them. You know, there's a lot of rappers with the name that ain't, ain't around. And not satisfied with simply standing at number one, Snoop is determined to become an A-list actor, similar to the illustrious Danzel Washington with whom he shared the screen with as a paraplegic drug dealer in Training Day. Brody has agreed to star in and executive produce a feature film based on his real life experiences as coach of his young son's football team. The movie is tentatively titled Coach Snoop. The dog father also stepped into the radio with a deal with XM Satellite Radio to host his own series from home. The series will be called Welcome to the Church with Big Snoop Dogg and the renewal by MTV of Doggy Fizzle Televizzle, and Snoop is doing big things in all media, and he shows no sign of stopping. I was waiting for a friend in the lobby, and uh, this mass of people walking through the lobby, different guys and whatnot, and um, I was the only girl in the lobby at the time, so I was like a target. <laughs> it's nothing but guys, and they saw me, and I'm waiting. 
and they came up to me and I introduced myself and I'm a graduate of Westchester High School, okay, here in Los Angeles. And because I was in New York and because I see all I saw all these LA based guys and they're walking by me, they're looking at me and whatnot. Um, when they were and they had their backs towards turned towards me, I decided to say, you know, I'm from Westchester, I'm a Westchester graduate, and they all turned around. And they were like, word, Westchester, Westchester, because it was, you know, this commonality. We're both in New York, but you have a girl from, he was very much from LA, saying she's from Westchester High School. They were just very nice to me, and everyone was shaking hands, introducing themselves. And he wasn't able to talk to me necessarily for um, too much of a long time. They were rushing to go somewhere else. But he was very nice in passing. It was just a very brief introduction, but they were just really happy with the fact that I was from Westchester, just from LA. Somebody Gotta love gin and juice, very first one. I like murder was the case. I don't know why. It just reminds me of San Francisco days. I don't know. And um, I like a lot of the new stuff that he's got out now, like with Pharrell. Beautiful was good. I really like the very first one that he did, gin and juice, because um, he was gay. I mean, just it was him, and he. He almost had a, a problem looking into the camera. You could tell he was still shy. He was so laid back, and he wasn't he wasn't into the the, the whole camera aspect of the music video. And I think at, it was that video that you really got to see who he is and where he came from. With many forces pushing against him, Snoop took every setback with ease and maneuvered himself to a position further than number one. Many questioned if this gangster could reform. Now a household name and a hip-hop legend, with an entire football team of little eyes looking up to Coach Snoop, Brodius has proved that he has. He even ended his foray into adult entertainment in an attempt to reconcile with his ex-wife. From Long Beach to Diamond Bar, gang-banging to Coach Pop Warner football, there was nothing easy about Calvin Brodius' journey to number one. But he has made it, and he is here now, and the future only looks brighter. Thank you.